Brett, it's great to be with you here tonight. There's a lot to talk about. A lot has been going on in the world over the last couple of weeks and days, um, and there are various areas that I hope we can touch upon together tonight. The first area that I want to ask you about um, is a topic of great importance both to Israel domestically and the United States as foreign relations, um, which is the Hamas Fatah unity deal, which occurred a couple of weeks ago, and America's response to that, to that agreement. Um, so I guess my question is, what do you think of the way America has reacted to this new agreement, and what steps, if you were in charge, what should America take um, in terms of dealing with this new government going forward? The administration's reaction to the deal has been to pretend that um, Hamas is not joining the government, that there is no reconciliation, that this fiction of a government of so-called technocrats is sustainable, and that the United States should not be enjoined to cease its delivery of $400 million of aid to a government that now includes as its member a group that has in its charter a call to murder Jews. And I think that's a disgrace. I think the proper reaction of the United States government should have been to instant to have long warned Abbas that any effort to reconcile with Hamas would end um, all U.S. financial support and that the United States would support Israel in doing the same. And you know, let's remember that even a Secretary of State who was not particularly well known for um, being excessively sympathetic to the State of Israel, James Baker, um, also uh, acted very harshly against the PLO uh, in the late 1980s and early uh, 1990s when it reneged on its um, uh, pledges to abandon terrorism when it sided with, with Saddam Hussein. The basic problem with American policy um, in, uh, towards uh, uh, the Palestinians is what I said below is, is to quote the great philosopher George uh, Walker Bush, um, the soft bigotry of low expectations. What I mean by that is we act as if we should have no expectations of the Palestinians before they're given a state. There are all kinds of stateless people in the world. The Kurds don't have a state. The Tamils don't have a state. Biafrans in Nigeria, for those of you with longer memories, don't have a state. So presumably there ought to be some kind of moral claim to statehood based on some kind of moral performance before the world simply hands you a state. If we were to simply hand every ethnicity in the world with some pretense to statehood a state, we would have global pandemonium. We would have not 190 countries, we would have 1,000 countries, and they would all be at war with one another. So why exactly should the Palestinians have a state? Well, it seems to me that at least one expectation should be um, that it be an actual democracy. Mahmoud Abbas was last elected in 2005, has never stood for uh, re-election uh, since then. That it should be willing, in a genuine sense, to live at peace with its neighbors. It's manifestly clear that the Palestinians are not. And that it should be, forgive me for being old-fashioned, um, a contributor, if you will, to the, march of, uh, uh, to the march of civilization. At least, at a minimum, that it should abide by certain liberal values. I find it amazing that the Obama administration, which has rightly denounced the Putin government for its behavior towards Russian uh, gays and lesbians, says nothing about the way in which the Palestinians treat gays and lesbians. I find it amazing that this administration, with Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, and I just saw her this morning at the Council on Foreign Relations, really does not have a lot to say about the way in which women are systematically discriminated against throughout the Palestinian territories. I'm not talking about democracy, I'm talking about basic liberal standards and values. So we should start insisting that the Palestinians live up to those standards and values and not automatically suggesting that, well, we're gonna give them a state no matter what kind of state it is. We do not need to midwife into existence a 23rd failed Arab state, a 23rd Arab dictatorship. <laughs> and by the way, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up here, and I've said this many times, I am not against a two-state solution. If the other state is Canada, I am in favor of Canada. <laughs> and I mean that. None of us cares where the, four, you know, that the 49th, the, the border between the U.S. and Canada, in the, at least after the Great Lakes, is the 49th parallel. Why do we care? Of course we don't, because Canada is a country that shares our values, 
It doesn't threaten us. It uh, contributes in all kinds of ways to North America, to the world. So who cares? I mean, if Canada, if tomorrow you were to discover that there had been some kind of clerical error back in the 1840s, and Canada were to seize all land going you know, down to the 48th parallel, most of us would shrug our shoulders because the values are the same. The conflict that Israel has with its neighbor is not ultimately territorial. It's a conflict based on values, and it's a conflict based on a Palestinian reluctance and actually refusal to recognize a Jewish state in any territory. So until that changes, I don't see Israel being able to live in peace with its neighbors, and I don't think the United States should play a game of make-believe that Mahmoud Abbas is a partner for peace or that this Hamas Fatah condominium is anything but a disaster for Israel, a disaster for, uh, for, for, for the region, and ultimately a disaster for the Palestinians as well. follow up on some of what you said. Um, as we both know, there seems to be a, ma a majority of Palestinians um, aren't in favor of Hamas because of you know, various ways that they don't treat the population well within Gaza itself. They're bad leaders. They're bad rulers. Um, but it seems to me that sometimes there are those critics who will say that Israel refuses to negotiate with um, the Palestinians when Hamas is its own entity because then the Palestinians are divided. And then there are also, once there is a unity agreement and they're on the same side, Israel still refuses to negotiate because now you have an agreement with Hamas. So I guess my question is, does it seem to you that Israel is only here willing to negotiate with the enemy that it wishes it has as opposed to the enemy that it actually does have? And what do we do with Hamas as long as they're here, as long as they don't go away? Well, first of all, you don't negotiate with your enemy. You fight your enemy, right? Or you oppose your enemy. Okay? You negotiate with your former enemy, perhaps, right? We didn't open negotiations with the Nazis in 1944 to explore new avenues for peace, we defeated them. And then, lo and behold, we got a Germany that turns out to be a peaceful democratic state that's a great you know, net contributor to the world. That's a good thing. So the suggestion that somehow Israel is being remiss for not wanting to negotiate with uh, uh, a political entity that either does not speak for all of its uh, members or all of its uh, uh, area, or includes within it a party sworn to Israel's destruction seems to be completely, uh, a, a completely coherent uh, uh, position. You know, we've, we've become, politically we've become addicted to stupid cliches. And, and uh, uh, you know, Rabin, who was great in many ways, had this line, well, you don't negotiate, you know, you don't make peace with your, your friends, you make peace with your, your enemies. You make peace with your former enemies. It was only after the PLO formally renounced its claims for the, you know, its, its, its desire to, uh, to destroy Israel and, 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 and accepted what it you know, thought was a, you know, what it claimed was a two-state solution that you negotiated with them. But somehow we've taken this Rabin injunction to be a rabbinical injunction, uh, if you will forgive the really bad pun. Um, <laughs> However, I just came up with it, so it's not bad. <laughs> uh, and we've taken it to a degree that I think is quite foolish. Um, we cannot, Israel cannot negotiate with a, part, with a party that aims for Israel's destruction. That is, the, you know, the baseline of any negotiation. You know, here, have my candy. I want to kill you. Well, don't give him the candy. Uh, um, and people say, well, you know, this means that Israel is going to not have a solution for, you know, it won't be peace for, for a long time. Look, you know, there hasn't been peace for 66 uh, years, okay? In the meantime, Israel has become this extraordinary country. Uh, and so that's what it will have to be until there is a sea change, not only in Palestinian, but Arab political culture in its attitude towards strangers, in its attitude towards a non-Jewish state in the Middle East. Um, and I hope that day comes soon. But it's not going to come if we all pretend that the Arab world doesn't fundamentally need to change. If we all pretend that we can just accept that Palestine, if it comes into being, is going to be another dictatorship led by uh, religious fanatics. And that's just fine with us because what? Because we have a clear conscience that we, we have now a two-state solution. It's not a two-state solution. The day there's a two-state solution, the sun will rise again, and you will have more problems. And you will discover that you have an enemy, except the enemy is now behind an international line. And it will make it that much more difficult. And all Israel will have done is exchange the problems of post-1967 
for the problems of pre-1967. I'm not sure that the post-1967 problems are really worse than the, uh, or better than the uh, uh, pre ones. So talking about dictatorships and, and hopefully leaving from that model, um, the Palestinians with this new unity government are going to have to have elections. I think it's scheduled for early next year or something. Um, do you see any role that America can play in, in making those elections as democratic as possible or at least different than they were in 2006? And do you see there being any leadership in the Palestinian government within the next round that is able to potentially change the trajectory of things? Well, I think um, the United States needs to take a Hippocratic oath and first do no harm. Uh, and one, I think the worst thing that the United States could do is recognize any elected government as being a legitimate government. Just because there's an election doesn't make it, uh, doesn't make it legitimate. Um, you can, there is a phenomenon known as illiberal democracy. Hitler was elected in 1933. Erdogan was elected in 2003. Hamas was elected in 2006. And I don't think there's any law of nature that requires the United States to recognize something as somehow legitimate uh, just because an election took place. We recognize all kinds of dictatorships uh, in the world for whatever reasons, because uh, it's in our interests, or, 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 and, and, we, and we try to recognize most democracies, but we recognize democracies when they're liberal democracies. We should be troubled by illiberal democracies. Um, so what role can the United States play? Uh, it should make it very clear, and I wish it had, I, this is one of the great errors of Condi Rice's time as Secretary of State. There were many errors. Um, but I only have a few hours. Uh, um, but it should be made clear to Palestinians that there will be consequences for voting for Hamas. And by the way, I dispute your contention that Hamas is unpopular. I profoundly dispute that. Uh, um, I would argue, even today, that if an election were held, a free and fair election throughout the West Bank and Gaza, that Hamas would win a plurality of seats. I guess there are polls going both ways, but I've seen polls saying that. I mean, the way all these all these polls from Shikaki, they're all worthless. Um, in 2006, Shikaki was saying that Fatah was going to easily outpoll uh, um, uh, Hamas, and and the people in the State Department reported this to Condi Rice, which is why she nearly fell off of her of her uh, exercise machine when she learned the result. But anyone who had a sense of what was actually going on in the Palestinian Authority must have understood that Fatah was kleptocratic um, and, and uh, increasingly obnoxious to a lot of Palestinians who respect Hamas because Hamas seems to have an ethic. All of us would agree it's a perverted ethic, but it is an ethic. No Jewish conversation, um, no pro-Israel conversation about Israel is complete without a discussion of Iran. Um, and there's been some recent news in terms of the state of the negotiations, so I thought we'd bring that up. Um, it seems that there has been a kind of impasse where the Iranians are insisting on nuclear enrichment of a certain amount. Um, the Americans are not willing to go that far. I don't, so my question is, I don't understand why this wasn't clear to both sides to begin with before the original November agreement, that there was a fundamental um, discrepancy in where both sides are willing to go. And given that the negotiations don't seem to be going anywhere, where do we go from now, given where we're finding ourselves? Well, um, there are two bad outcomes to these negotiations. Um, the less bad outcome is that they don't succeed. But the worst possible outcome is a quote unquote success. Because a country like Iran that has cheated on all of its nuclear agreements um, with the IAEA, with the EU3, with the P5 plus one, okay, is probably not going to be faithful to any agreement it may sign now. Or it will be faithful only as long as it is convenient to Iran, and it will seize any pretext um, and any subterfuge to break it. In the meantime, a successful agreement would mean that the West would begin immediately delivering um, uh, sanctions relief, diplomatic recognition, to Iran, that the goodies would start coming before the Iranians, uh, uh, before the Iranians deliver. And it's actually one of the great mysteries of democratic life, why, why it is that democratic leaders always seem so eager to negotiate bad deals 
with, with dictatorial leaders. I was in Yalta at the palace of, uh, where um, uh, the Yalta Agreement was, uh, was signed in, in, 1940, in January of 1945. And it's actually, political psychologists need to get into this field. The yearning of the democratic leader to strike a deal with the authoritarian. Probably because the democratic leader always thinks that his personal charm and charisma, what brought him to office, is going to succeed with a guy who murdered his way into, uh, into his office. One thing that people should be aware of is, I mean, when you think about, I often think, what are the skills that are required to be a great dictator? I mean, because there's a skill set that goes, to it, or goes into it. I would say that the number one skill is to be able to spot and exploit the weakness of your adversary. And I think the Iranians have clearly spotted and are exploiting the weakness of an American administration that wants nothing so much as to sign an agreement, that wants nothing so much as to reduce our footprint in the Middle East, that wants nothing so much as another Nobel Peace Prize, that wants, nothing, uh, that, that, that wants nothing so much as to be able to wave a piece of paper and say, peace for our time. If you missed the Neville Chamberlain comparison, it was fully intended. Um, by the way, ne Neville Chamberlain was a, a paradigmatic, people treat him as a, as a devil. He was a classic Tory British leader of his era. Um, so this is, I think, what Khamenei knows. And in fact, Khamenei said so just uh, the other day. He said, the West has no appetite for military strikes. So he knows this. What do I think is going to happen? I think there's going to be no agreement in this round, and I think there's been, they're going to sign for a six-month extension of the interim agreement. And then sometime in November, or let's see, in July, so the extension would go to December or January, uh, either the Iranians will be very clever and they'll sign something, um, or they'll be uh, brazen and they won't sign anything at all, thinking that Israel will do nothing. They know America's going to do nothing. They suspect Israel's going to do nothing. So what would you have done instead of the negotiating track that's, that's led nowhere? The question is what, what I would have done um, if, uh, instead of the negotiating. Instead of the, yeah, instead of the track America has taken. I would have told Iranians in the most clear way possible that they have a fundamental choice. They can choose to re remain in power. They can maintain their regime um, uh, uh, without a bomb. Um, or they can lose their regime with a bomb. And uh, look, the time for the kind of sanctions that were finally applied in 2010 was probably sometime around 2004. Uh, and it's a great pity that the Bush, the, I, I should say clearly, the Bush administration bears at least as much of the blame for the Iran debacle that we now find ourselves in as the Obama administration does. Um, but frankly, Obama is pursuing a policy not altogether different from, from Bush, a negotiations policy which Iranians are masters at, at using, abusing, and playing for time. So I would have, I would have inf had the kind of punitive financial sanctions early on. And I would have made perfectly clear that we were more than ready to entertain a, uh, uh, a military option. And look, people need to be clear. Any military option carries with it risk, and it carries with it unintended consequences. When the United States invaded Grenada 31 years ago, there were unintended consequences. Okay? That's, that's the nature of these things. The question is whether the perfectly foreseeable consequences of an Iran with nuclear weapons are better or worse than any conceivable menu of unintended consequences. And I don't see how a regime that is capable of stoning women or that hangs gay people as a matter of routine should be allowed to get, not within two months, six months, a year, but within decades of a nuclear bomb. I think it's insane, this game that the administration is playing. And by the way, stupid and arrogant. Um, you know, there, there's this view that Joe Biden took during the 2012 debate in which he said, oh, we're, we'll know when the Iranians get close to a bomb. You know, oh, Joe Biden will know. Um, I mean, that's, that's funny even among Democrats. Uh, um, but it's arrogant. And in fact, the Defense Science Board just this January released a very interesting report. This is a, a kind of high-level blue ribbon report 
uh, from, from uh, uh, the Pentagon that made the point that it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to monitor nuclear proliferation or to verify nuclear agreements. In 1998, India tested a nuclear weapon. And do you want to know what? The CIA had no idea that was coming. India is an open society. We have good relationships with India. We have a huge embassy in New Delhi. We have consulates over, and we had no idea. So if we didn't know, if the brain trust at CIA didn't know that the Indians were about to test setting off an arms race in South Asia, how exactly are we going to know that a society that is as closed as Iran is, with ties that are as, clo that are as close as Iran's are to North Korea, is going to acquire nuclear weapons and when? As I said, it's an arrogant conceit. You know, the lesson of, of the Iraq WMD intelligence debacle isn't that the intelligence was hyped. It's that intelligence is poor. As Daniel Patrick Moynihan of blessed memory once said, intelligence is not to be mistaken for intelligence. <laughs> and we thought in America that the Soviets would not be able to get a bomb until the 1950s. What we didn't know was that Los Alamos was riddled with spies, and they de detonated the bomb in 1949. We have been consistently, the story of nuclear proliferation is that the US is always surprised when there's a, pro there, there's a proliferation event. And that's going to happen, happen with Iran. So this game we're playing, well, you know, we're going to have two months to know, is, is ridiculous and dangerous and, and, and feckless by this administration. I'm glad that you brought up um, the human rights abuses in Iran, because something that's, that's always struck me about America's policy towards Iran has been its consistent neglect of doing anything, um, so much as mentioning, but doing anything in terms of the human rights abuses that have gone on um, for decades there, and even under a supposed moderate Rouhani continue. Um, Obama obviously is complicit in this, that, that he did nothing in 2009. Um, so I guess my question here is, do you think there is a way that America can engage Iran both on the nuclear issue as it's currently doing and on the human rights issue? Uh, or do you think that those two are somehow mutually exclusive and we have to pick the greater battle, as it were? No, I mean, you know, unlike Gerald Ford, we should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, sorry. Gerald Ford was deserved better than that. But that was the joke about <laughs> Gerald Ford. Um, we should absolutely, look, um, the rabbi mentioned the cause of Soviet Jewry. And during that movement, um, names like Andrei Sakharov, Natan Sharansky, all of these great Sovi uh, Soviet Jewish dissidents, they were names in our mouth. We knew who they were. We followed them. Who knows today in this audience who's in Avin prison? Who are the leaders of the Green Movement? What's the situation with Musavi's health or Karabi's house arrest? I mean, every now and then you meet these Iranians who are exiles here, and they'll say, oh, there's this great dissident. But no one has heard about these people. And I think it's a disgrace that we basically say nothing about the status of, of, of Iranian human rights as it relates to ethnic minorities, as it relates to political dissidents, as it relates to women, as it re relates to, get, to gay Iranians. Why can't we have the same movement with Iran's political dissidents that we had with Soviet Jewry or with the leaders of the Solidarity Movement in, uh, uh, in Poland. Because over the long term, our only real security from Iran is internal regime change. I, I would argue that Iranians are some of the most pro-American people on Earth because they've been inoculated after 35 years of terror uh, against the, the virus of Islamist uh, indoctrination and radicalism. And so we should want to see and we should promote an agenda that leads to um, uh, the ultimate overthrow of this regime. However, just because you have a long-term strategy doesn't mean you shouldn't also have a short-term strategy, and the two might coincide. Bear this example in mind. People, and smart people, have often said, if you attack Iran, you're going to give this regime what Bernard Lewis called the gift of Iranian patriotism. And I have great respect for Bernard Lewis, and whenever he speaks, you have to think about it very seriously. But I disagree with him in this respect. And why is that? In 1982, a horrible regime in Argentina, which was busy throwing people off helicopters, decided, because it had an economic crisis, to invade uh, Las Malvinas, the Falkland Islands. 
And suddenly the Argentines went nuts and they loved this. And, you know, this was the redemption of you know, Argentina and the, the, the junta suddenly became very popular. And then this woman with a handbag said, uh, and uh, two months later, they, the, the, the great heroic liberation of Las Malvinas was a rout. The Galtieri regime, the junta in Argentina, fell within a week. And why is that? Because failure is not a good political strategy for any country. Milosevic stood for Kosovo in 1999, but when he lost Kosovo, he was gone within a year. I was just in, uh, I was just in Belgrade talking about this, this, ver this very subject. What it tells you is um, investing all your eggs expensively in this one nuclear basket and watching them go up in smoke and ash is not going to redound politically in favor of this Iranian regime. It's going to hurt it. I mean, you hear these arguments being made by supposedly smart people saying, oh, you know, the Iranians want nothing more than for us to bomb them. Really? Really? I doubt that very much. Um, I mean, if they wanted us to bomb them so much, they wouldn't be spending billions of dollars putting these installations, these enrichment facilities, in, in supposedly impenetrable bunkers in mountains. So it's another stu You know, my colleague Holman Jenkins has a wonderful line. He says, there are certain arguments that vanish in the presence of thought. Uh, and that's one of them. I want, to, um, I want to turn for a minute to a question from the audience about um, another troubled spot in the world. Um, I guess it broke headlines either this morning or yesterday morning that the second largest city in Iraq has been taken over by the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, um, a new Al-Qaeda somewhat aligned organization. Um, the question is, what kind of threat, if any, does this group pose to Israel? Um, and just in terms of your thoughts on foreign policy, what might America be able to do to deal with this new threat? Well, readers of the Wall Street Journal will find an excellent unsigned editorial in tomorrow's paper on this very subject. Um, uh, and if you're not a subscriber, I'll be selling subscriptions later on. Uh, look, this is a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe for Iraq. It's a catastrophe for the region. It's a catastrophe for the United States, and it's potentially a catastrophe for Israel. What we're looking at is the possibility of Iraq dividing very, very, along, very violently into a, an al-Qaeda state stretching from the outskirts of Aleppo all the way to Fallujah um, that is going to become a massive incubator for jihadism. You know, the Taliban, think about it, the Taliban sponsored a terrorist group. But I'm not sure there is any example in history of terrorists actually running a state. Iraq had all kinds of little terrorist groups, Abu Nidal, these characters running with it, within it. This would be the first example of a state that is run by terrorists. That cannot be a good thing, never mind for Iraqi interests, for our interests. There are at least a thousand, people talk about at least a thousand European citizens who are fighters in ISIS, this uh, Islamic State of Iraq and, and, and Syria, the Al Qaeda affiliate there. And there's some Americans. So it should be, go without saying that if this administration cares about fighting al-Qaeda, which last I heard from the president was on a path to defeat, um, right? Uh, uh, we, should, we should stop it. And we should intervene very quickly to make sure that Baghdad doesn't fall the way Saigon fell in 1975 or Phnom Penh uh, uh, to the Khmer Rouge that same year. Not least because we don't want the kind of bloodbath that would, that would follow. Second thing is, what is Maliki going to do if we don't help him? He's going to turn to uh, his frenemies in Tehran. And Iran is already very swiftly moving in to shore up the Maliki government, and it's going to consolidate its position. So we're going to see two strategic disasters at once if we do nothing, which is the creation of an al-Qaeda state and the vast expansion of Iran's de facto, de facto sovereignty all the way to the Tigris and the Euphrates. And that's a real problem. So we need to think. We need to think hard about what we do and what we do, uh, uh, what we do right now. And it ought to give pause to critics of the war to see just what has happened following the full withdrawal of American troops. Because I think if there were 15,000 US troops, this would not be happening. Uh, um, so uh, you know, the world does not take care of itself when American power retreats. This is why I've written this, this book, um, American Retreat. One last point. I think there's a temptation to think that, well, you know, wouldn't it, it wouldn't be so bad if the Sunnis and Shiites just spent the next 10 years killing one another, right? And let's imagine, let's, let's play out this fantasy. 
let's say a million Sunnis die and a million Shiites die, leaving aside the moral question of, of the fact that these deaths would be you know, women and children and innocents and so on. Let's say we're enjoying, oh, isn't it great? You know, Henry Kissinger had this line about the Iran-Iraq war, may, may, may it go on forever or something like that. I don't know if that was Kissinger, but someone once said that. Um, well, I'm not sure that's a good idea because if you think of the Iran-Iraq war where about a million people died on each side, Iraq turned around from that war and promptly invaded Kuwait and we had a, we had a 13 year international, actually a 20 year international crisis involving Iraq. And Iran turned around from the Iran-Iraq war and started bombing Jewish cultural centers in Buenos Aires and building a nuclear weapon and becoming a major sponsor of terrorism. So this idea that somehow a terrible civil war will weaken either side is, is a fantasy. It might strengthen them. It might turn Al-Qaeda into a battle-hardened uh, a, a battle hardened entity. Uh, we should want to stop this, of course for the humanitarian reason as well for the strategic reasons. Just a follow-up question in terms of what, you know, what practical steps we should take. Um, it seems, to, from what I understand, one of the reasons that this ISIS has been able to be so successful is that they're a Sunni group and the current government of Iraq that was put in place after the American occupation is a Shia group. And it's that sectarian tension largely or somewhat caused by American boots on the ground um, that led to this new terrorist organization being able to make such a strong, um, to, to, to really take these, these, these provocative steps. Um, so my question is on the one hand, American boots on the ground perhaps exacerbated the situation by letting it get to where it is today. But on the other hand, if we do nothing, like you said, it's a catastrophe to allow a terrorist organization to actually be in control of territory. So what kinds of actions um, do you think America should, in terms of practical steps, take here? Well, the first thing we should do is send a flight of Apache helicopters to stop these more raiding barbarians from reaching Baghdad, which is exactly what the French did uh, in Mali in, in just, just uh, in early 2013. Mali was, I mean, this scenario is very much like Mali. This country was about to be over, overrun by Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, allied with uh, Tuareg tribes, uh, Sunni Tuareg tribes in northern Mali, uh, and the French wouldn't stand for it. Of course, France now represents muscular Western diplomacy in the world, which is either very good for France or very bad for the world. Um, uh, uh, and they stopped it. The French Foreign Legion and French air power stopped it. This was, you know, France is essentially a, a second-rate power, but they acted because they, they, they had a sense of responsibility, which I'm afraid, I'm not sure we have, uh, uh, we have any longer. To your first point, look, in 2009, as the surge uh, uh, was winding down. We had more troops, more boots on the ground in Iraq than ever, and yet Iraq was more peaceful than ever. And America was a great and honest broker between the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shiites, and that was the role it could have performed, as well as a tripwire. And we had extraordinary diplomats like Ryan Crocker and generals like David Petraeus who were trusted on all sides. American, you know, this idea is like, oh, don't put America in there because America is always hated. There's so much self-loathing in that, in that statement. America was the margin in Iraq between civilization or peace, at least peace, and chaos. And you removed Iraq from the equation and not surprisingly you got, uh, you, you got chaos. Uh, so there, you know, Obama, I remember in 2009 after the, the stolen Iranian revolution said, well, I don't want to say anything because any time America opens its mouth we'll be accused of meddling. Well, Khamenei instantly couldn't care less that Obama wasn't saying anything. He instantly accused the United States of orchestrating the Green Revolution. Uh, and even Hillary Clinton in her memoir acknowledges what, uh, what a mistake it is. But the world is well served by American power and the world is well served when America has a clear and clarion moral voice. So I think we'll return to foreign policy in a few minutes. I thought um, now we'd change tunes a little bit to discuss, I guess, our role in this room um, and what we do as defenders of Israel, supporters of Israel. Um, I found myself stricken and somewhat, I guess, saddened by the name of the talk for this evening, that a talk on Israel still 60 years after its existence has to be called on defending Israel. And I worry that it seems that for such a long time, Israel has to be a cause that we support as opposed to a normal country, um, part of the community of nations, 
that we can support at times, criticize at times, and it doesn't have this, it doesn't, have, it doesn't lead us to have to have this kind of team-like spirit um, due to the kind of criticisms that Israel receives. So my, my question is, do you think there can be a time, and I know you're not a prophet, but you write good columns, so, um, do you think there can be a time where Israel is no longer going to have to be a cause that we support, but it can be a country that we just look at as another country? And if so, what steps do you think America can take or Israel should take to get there? <laughs> um, you know, Leo Strauss uh, once gave a wonderful speech in a synagogue in, in Chicago in 1962 when he offered the contention that the reason Jews are hated is they are a perennial reminder uh, to everyone in the world that um, uh, humanity is not redeemed. Uh, and uh, it's a profound, profound thought. Uh, I'm not a dyed-in-the-wool Straussian, but it's, it's worth thinking about. It's a kind of rebuke to the world that salvation has not come. Um, and uh, I don't think that will ever happen in my lifetime, and I don't think it will ever happen in my grandchildren's lifetime. And I think the reason for that is the nature of anti-Semitism and hatred or dislike of... Um, hatred or dislike of the Jews. You know, the definition of a British anti-Semite is someone who dislikes the Jews more than is absolutely necessary. Um, great line. Uh, why is that? Because anti-Semitism is somewhat distinct from racism. Um, anti-Semitism fundamentally, in my view, stems from envy. And envy is written into um, the human condition. It is a, a psychology that uh, is never likely going to be eradicated. And it's not surprising that as Jews wander from country, have wandered from country to country, and have succeeded in ways that uh, are a constant surprise given how poor they, you know, how, you know, given, their be given where they begin and where they end up, that they are going to incite envy in many of their host countries. And one of the great miracles of the United States uh, is that this is the one country in the world where that has never happened. Not to my knowledge, at least, no, no pogrom in the United States. Why is that, by the way? Because the United States, uniquely among countries, is a country that is not based on envy. Capitalism says, if Bill Gates makes a lot of money, you can make some money too. So Bill Gates isn't taking money from me because he's worth umpteen billion, billion dollars. I admire his success, I don't envy it. That's not so true in Europe, by the way, which is based on a kind of envy economy. I've always viewed the the animating impulse and the abiding attraction of socialism is that it's based on a kind of envy. Well, Israel will always incite a kind of envy, all the more so now that you see the difference between what is happening in Tel Aviv versus what is happening, say, uh, 100 miles away in, in, in Damascus or, uh, uh, or Homs. So I think there's always going to be a necessity to defend this country. Uh, um, and it's always going to be uh, incumbent on us. And there's always going to be a risk of becoming tired of it. Um, this is, uh, you know, it's, I was very tickled by the Pulitzer citation because I think it got one thing right, which is that I'm a born contrarian. Uh, I don't know why. Something in the water my mother was drinking uh, uh, around the time of conception or something. Um, but I'm, I'm just a born contrarian. And so I, peop, I've always liked being unfashionable, you know. I don't want to walk with, with the herd, and, and, but that's, that's not an easy thing to do. To be pro-Israel is to be decidedly unfashionable. And it takes some, uh, in the language of my forefathers, cojones, uh, to, uh, to embrace that unfashionableness. Uh, um, it's much easier, you know, I see, I see these Jewish kids, you know, the. Uh, who are leading the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, and I basically think of them as cowards. They think they're so courageous because they'll say, you know, I'm a nice Jewish boy, but, you know, I've realized that the plight of the Palestinians is so great that my conscience couldn't allow, and I took a solidarity trip to Ramallah, and I was horrified by the wall. They're cowards. They're joiners. The hard thing is to defend what's your own. Looking at the audience, um, I'm glad to see, but it's also interesting to see that many of you are wearing yarmulkes. Um, and of course, we're in a synagogue, so I guess that's somewhat appropriate. But the question is, what role, I guess, has your 
um, Jewish background played in your support of Israel? What role do you think Judaism has to play in support of Israel? And I guess going to some of what I do on a college campus, it seems often the case that aside from these you know, Jewish students that take um, the Palestinian side, um, it's very often the case that when you talk to someone who's non-Jewish, they'll see the claims that you present of why Israel's worth um, defending, and they'll see the claims that Palestinians um, present about why their cause is more just. And they won't be able to um, equivocate between the two in a way that Jews are often always or automatically on the pro-Israel side. And so I guess, what role do you think Judaism should or has to play in being a supporter of Israel? I don't know, my standard joke is that I'm as minimally Jewish as you can be without actually being Unitarian. Um, <laughs> and one of the oddities of my household is that my wife is German and is a convert. And she takes the whole thing much more seriously than I do. And it drives me bananas. Um, uh, uh, especially on the subject of wine, but that's, that's another story. Um, uh, when I was a teenager, my mother sent me off to uh, our Israeli relatives, or her, her Israeli relatives, uh, on a kibbutz uh, uh, in near Afula, kibbutz Hefsiba, and um, I hated it. And I hated everyone on the kibbutz, and they hated me. They, they hated me with better reason than I hated them. I, I can say that now. And just, just to let my mother know how I felt, I stepped off the El Al flight at, at Kennedy Airport wearing a keffiyeh and a kaftan and Ray-Ban sunglasses. So, you know, I've come a long way, baby, uh, uh, from, from, uh, uh, from that. Um, look, my Judaism is very religiously very minimal. But I'll tell you this, I feel a profound sense of fidelity for my ancestors, Jews, who struggled so much on my father's side in places like Kishnev, on my mother's side in Vilna. My uh, grandmother was born, my maternal grandmother was born in Vilna, and then spent her early years in Moscow. They were kicked out by the, the Bolsheviks. They went to Germany, then they had to flee Germany, then they were in Italy during the war. And I feel a profound sense of duty to those generations um, to keep their side, to honor what they did, um, and to be mindful also of what Jews have created. I was just listening to a rabbi downstairs imagining if he could take a picture book of modern day Israel and show it to previous generations of Jews. And anyone who goes to Israel, I mean, you have to have your head up your you know what not to look around and say, this is fantastic. This is amazing. Uh, now, I once had a conversation when I, when I uh, was living in Israel with a, a senior BBC correspondent. He was a very nice guy. He was a very well-meaning guy. Um, and you know, he wasn't sort of this knee-jerk Israel hater. And I said, well, you know what? What are your impressions of this? And he, he made this weird remark, which he said, well, I just feel that Israel is sort of artificial. Um, and I said, as opposed to the Palestinians who are authentic. And he said, well, yeah. And, but you know what? It was, it was an honest, I appreciated the remark because there was some honesty. And why was Israel, quote, artificial? Because there they were building a modern society with roads and stoplights that worked and streets that aren't filthy and elevators that function and toilets that flush. Um, Whereas, you know, in Palestine, you get the authenticity of a third world, dysfunctional, kleptocratic, violent, fanatical society. And there's something with us Westerners that kind of likes that because it's, quote, real, because you're slumming it, right? There you are in Ramallah and you're hanging out with your friend Khalid and you're talking about his, you know, grandfather's fictional orange orchard. I've done, I've had these conversations. They're all the same goddamn orchard. Uh, excuse my profanity. Um, and, uh, um, and I don't feel that. Actually, I look at Israel, and I see the most authentic society in the world. Every tree, practically, that you see was planted. And all these streets were planned. And all these buildings are the work of a Jewish civilization that comes from the 
roots up. And I find that a totally exhilarating feeling. And I think that's something we should support. You know, people talk, we spend so much time talking about identity. But identity can also be where you're going, not just where you came from. And you look at Israel and say, is that the identity I want in terms of where I'm going? And I would say, yes, it is. I'd rather that than live in some horrible third world country and get my head kicked in from time to time by thugs from Hamas. If um, people like Eric Cantor, who supported Israel and have taken a more robust um, position in terms of foreign policy, are being pushed out, and Tea Party supporters who are more inclined to be isolationist are moving in, how does that bode for Republican foreign policy or American support of Israel in the future? Uh, I think Cantor is obviously a loss uh, to the Jewish community, and you could see what a fine man he was if you listen to his uh, concession speech, uh, which was just the epitome of, of, of graciousness and, and dignity, and he talked about his, his Jewish values, and one of the Jewish values is learning how to deal with, uh, with a setback. Um, so leaving that, the politics of it aside, let me talk a bit about the Tea Party. I do worry about the Tea Party. A uh, Tea Party is a movement, and it encompasses all kinds of people with all kinds of uh, persuasions. Um, but I do think that at least the Tea Party as represented by someone like Rand Paul is a worrisome development for the Republican Party. It harks back to the Republican Party as it was once led by people like Robert Taft, uh, the, the great isolationist of the 1930s and then of the, of the immediate um, uh, post-war era. When you start to listen to what Tea Party people have to say on a number of issues, it sounds an awful lot like what the progressive left has to say. And I always love these people at the nation going, oh my God, the Tea Party, they're so awful. But on foreign policy, the Tea Party and, and, and uh, readers of the nation are a distinction without a difference. How do you feel about Ed Snowden? Oh, he's a hero, great civil disobedient, right? Um, what do you think about Syria? America out of Syria, right? Uh, this, the lot of, on, a, on a whole number of issues, uh, there's the French expression, there's extremes to chant, you know, the, 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 extremes, the extremes touch. And, uh, and I think, that's something that we ought to be mindful of. America needs a bipartisan internationalist consensus that understands that if there isn't Pax Americana, there's anarchy. Because the UN isn't going to do the job, and we certainly don't want the Russians, Chinese, and Iranians doing the job. So the United States learned in 1947 not to repeat the mistake of the 1920s, not to think that the world would take care of itself, to understand that American power throughout the world is the margin between civilization and barbarism, between a peaceful world order and a prosperous and free trading world order and the world order that we had in the 1920s and 1930s when suddenly the dictatorships of the world, at the time then in Germany, Italy, and Japan, now in Russia, China, and Iran, realized that they confronted no serious opposition from the West, from the liberal democracies. And as soon as they've realized that, it's open season. It's not an accident that what happened in Crimea came just after what happened in Syria. It's like, you know what, what James Q. Wilson used to talk about, the broken windows. When there's disorder in a neighborhood, it spreads very quickly. If someone sees one broken window, they're going to smash all the windows. That's what we have. We're entering into a world, we're entering into a broken windows world. And let me add also, this is, I don't have an answer to this. I'm, I'm thinking of writing an essay about this. You know, Fareed Zakaria, who, by the way, I like, I like a great deal. And he's, uh, he's, he's been an absolute mensch. Um, I don't agree with him, but I like him. Uh, uh, Fareed Zakaria wrote this interesting book called The Post-American World, which made the case that countries like China and India and Turkey and Brazil were rising and the United States would no longer have that preeminent uh, position. I think he's... He's wrong. I actually think America will be the dominant power. I don't for one second believe that we're about to be overtaken by China. They said that about Japan 25 years ago. They said that about the Soviet Union 25 years before that. It's all baloney, uh, but that's a speech for, uh, uh, for another day. But we, are, we may be entering into a different kind of post-American world. That is to say, a world where the United States is not asserting itself as forcefully as it used to. And so, Iraq now discovers, hey, you know, help us, America, and America uh, is not around. 
Israel came of age, Israel was born less than a year after the enunciation of the Truman Doctrine in 1947. The Truman Doctrine is the beginning of Pax Americana. Israel has only known one international order. What happens when America renounces its responsibilities as the guarantor of international order? What does a small country like Israel do? Who are its new allies? It has to start thinking about that now. Israel has reflexively thought that when push comes to shove, America will be at its side or, with, or have its back. I think Israelis, I, I'd like to think this is not the case. I'm going to work to make sure this is not the case. But Israelis and those of us who care for Israel need to start thinking about the security arrangements Israel will have to make to survive in a new kind of post-American world where the United, just as, just as the French didn't want to die for Danzig, Americans won't want to die for Doha, and they might not want to die for Tel Aviv either. We should think about it. The last question um, from someone in the audience asks about um, your advice to young advocates in the room. And the specific question is, how have you managed um, to consistently make your voice heard on these issues at such a young age? And I guess in connection with that, what advice would you give to young journalists or young aspiring politicians who, who want to keep the world like, like, like it needs to be? Um, geez. Uh, look, a few points. Uh, number one, there's a great opportunity for Israel advocates that we're not exploiting right now. We spend altogether too much time on campuses like Columbia or uh, um, UC Irvine or, or wherever these sort of hotbeds of anti-Israel activism, forgetting that in flyover country where there are millions of college students, no BDS campaigns, there is ripe fruit to be picked. There is a philo-Semitic world. There are people who for whatever mysterious reasons, aren't automatically disposed to dislike Jews. Actually, they're automatically disposed to kind of like Jews, and not just in the United States, but all over the world. And you know, if you tell a Spaniard, well, do you think the Jews are good at, you know, I don't want to pick on the Spanish, but you know, paradigmatic European, Jews are good at business, right? They'll say, yeah, they're good at business, and it means a bad thing. But if you tell that to someone in China or South Korea, they'll be like, yeah, the Jews are good in business, and we want to be good in business like they are. Um, so, there's this philo-Semitic world, and we ought to be doing more by way of, of, of creating friendships with friendly communities rather than trying to win over pseudo-intellectuals uh, at various universities that were formerly top-ranked, um, uh, <laughs> Columbia accepted, uh, and, uh, and, and, and essentially, uh, you know, at best, fighting our way to a standstill. That's, that's point one. Let's reach out to the philo-Semitic world a great deal, a great deal more than, uh, uh, than we do. Um, the second thing is, uh, I said this below, but um, we really need to work on our game in terms of, uh, terms of arguments. Uh, saying Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, or uh, we're fighting, Israelis are fighting the war against terror, against the Palestinians, these arguments don't particularly wash. Get into an argument with a liberal and say, you for gay rights? Oh, of course. Then why do you hate the country, the only country in the Middle East that supports gay rights? Because you can't be a gay person in Palestine. I have yet to be informed of the uh, LBGT committee forming at the Gaza Uni Islamic University of Gaza. By the way, when that happens, happy day, okay? You asked about a Palestinian state. When LGBT, okay, Forms at the Islamic University of Gaza, I am prepared for a Palestinian state. Actually, that's a really good formulation. We should use it. Um, uh, you're all laughing, but it's a really good point. It's rhetorical gold I'm giving you. Uh, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's one point. To conservatives who say, oh, you know, we're spending $3 billion a year supporting Israel. Well, you're spending $8 billion a year supporting Germany. We have 50,000 troops in Germany. Why don't we ever talk about the expense of that? And why don't we ever point out that while American soldiers die for Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan and Iraq, no American soldiers ever die for Israel? Point worth making. Uh, so those are some of the things we need to, uh, we need to start thinking about. Um, but you know what? I said this, I answered this question earlier uh, 
uh, in a different way. You asked, you know, would, would we, Israel ever be a normal country? And I don't think Israel ever will be a normal country because I also, because I don't think Jews will ever be, quote, normal average people. Uh, and you know what? Great. Why not? I mean, this is, this is, Jewish civilization has been marked by excellence in so many fields. And maybe what you're saying is, well, maybe if we were marked by mediocrity in more fields, we wouldn't incite so much, hen uh, so much uh, uh, envy. I'm not sure that's a bargain I'm prepared to accept. Um, and so you have to be willing to be hated. And by the way, not only do you have to be willing to be hated, you have to be willing to hate back. Now, this business of like, oh, I love everyone. I don't for a second believe that, okay? There are people who want to kill my children just because they're Jews, and I hate their guts. And you should too. And I think that's, that's, that's important. You know, kumbaya is, is not in the, in the Hebrew uh, uh, lexicon. Um, you have to understand, we have faced enemies for a very, very long time, and we have to look at them clearly. We have to understand who they are, and we have to be smart about defeating them. You know, people say, well, in every generation they rose up to destroy us, and you know, here, here we still are. Well, that's because previous generations suffered and worked and survived through their own wit and strength and courage and perseverance. And it was what my mother did and my grandmother did, and I think we should be doing it, um, uh, uh, we should be doing it as well. So the Jews are going to be hated, Israel is going to be hated. Not only accept the hatred, embrace the hatred, give some back, do something excellent, be proud of yourself, love your kids, love your kids more, more than uh, kids uh, 5,000 miles away because they're yours and the people 5,000 away, miles away can love their own children. Uh, and then, you know, and, and don't expect a solution. I hate this word. Jews should have been, I mean, why did Jews ever even use the word solution? Solution should be a word eradicated, right? We don't like solutions, okay? Life is management, okay? Life is the management of situations. And we need to manage our situation in our generation as best as we can to hand it over to our kids and grandkids. And if we can do that, we will have done our job. And uh, Dianu, it will be enough. Thank you. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.